the stories with Briscoe and Bradshaw. I will be Bradshaw. That will be the WWE Hall of Famer, Oklahoma's favorite son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And we got one of the most iconic tag teams of one of the most iconic times in WWE history. Former WWE Tag Team Champion, NWA Tag Team Champion. They are the Headbangers. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks for having us. Excited yeah. to be here. I, I, watch, I watch all your clips, and now that I'm on here, I'm even more excited. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> same here. Same here. Man, it's, it's awesome to have you guys on. I know you're all, you're both down in South Florida. I hope I'm right on that, but that's where that's where you guys base out of. I know you see my son a lot. He always tells tells you uh, tells me that you guys said hello. Hello, I appreciate that. You know, I, I've I've been fascinated by you guys' gimmick. Uh, you guys' character, whatever, whatever, whatever we're allowed to call it, gimmick, character, whatever. But I've been fascinated by them, how they, how they became uh, the headbangers and all that stuff. I've been doing a little research, which is always great on these shows. You get to do research on guys that you already know. <laughs> I, I was unaware of one, one of the other earlier, earlier uh, characters you guys played too. But tell us a little bit of what, 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 what I really find fascinating. You guys went to the monster factory. I, Good old Larry Sharp over there, God rest his soul. And Danny, uh, Danny is doing a great job there, uh, you know, keeping everything updated and keeping it rolling there. But you guys ended up there. Were you, were you guys high school friends? Is that how you both ended up at the Monster Factory? How, how does that happen? Uh, well, actually, I started the Monster Factory back in 1991. And, um, you know, I was in uh, high school wrestling, amateur wrestling and stuff like that. So we actually, I knew of Chaz but we never really met. He went to a sister's uh, school that was, you know, really close to us. We wrestled each other. Our schools wrestled each other every year, but we never really formally met until he came down to, as you see my background, the Monster Factory. Um, I, at that time, I was the, the head trainer for Larry Sharp. He wasn't doing much in the ring stuff. So it was just, it was weird. We just hit it off and uh, he's my longest relationship to date. <laughs> so... He's out blasting all my life. <laughs> they, 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 they have so many. Their, their alumni uh, chapter is huge. You know, goes bam, bam, big, a yeah. big show. Yeah. I mean, it, it goes on and on. And the greats and you guys, I've seen you guys as picture up. I've been fortunate enough to go up there and do some camp for those guys. I love their setup where they got the uh, the, the the wrestling mats along with the with yeah. the professional ring in there. And what a relationship they have with uh, Paulsboro coach there, with one of the yep. most successful coaches in the state of New Jersey, as you guys know. There. Oh yeah, we've wrestled them um, in high school. We wrestled Paulsboro then. They were actually in my conference in high school. Oh. And um, if we scored like two points, they would usually shut yeah. us out. It was like seventy-two nothing or sixty-eight to three. I mean, it was they all and, whole, and hopefully the three was yours. <laughs> um, yeah, of course it was. Course yes, it was. absolutely. <laughs> Undefeated in high school. Undefeated. <laughs> so you guys, you guys are both high school wrestlers, right? Tell, tell us a little bit. I, I, I love how guys got in the business and guys with their careers before they got in and whether they're fans or not. Tell us a little bit about your high school. Tell us a little bit about the, how, how you started, decided to go to Larry Sharp to begin with. So, so ahead, for me, for me, I started wrestling in I know, second or third grade through high school, and I dabbled a little bit in junior college. Um, so yeah, so I had the, the amateur background. I used to go, my friends and I would take the, the speed line over to Philly, over to the old spectrum to watch there. They were there once a month. Um, WWF was, and then WCW was at a different, at the convention center. So we'd go over there every now and then also. So I was always a, a fan growing up. I liked the, you know, I liked going and watching it. Um, there was a flea mart down the street from my house, about 10 minutes away called the route 30 flea mart. And I would drive by and Every now and then there'd be a big giant truck out front with literally hand hand spray painted <laughs> sign that said pro wrestling Saturday night, 8 PM. And it was the yeah. worst penmanship you've ever seen. It looked like a, <laughs> it looked like a five-year-old spray painted it on there. I, I so, think they actually spelled here as H-E-A-R. <laughs> and what, 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 what was that? Was that Glenn make, writing those signs out? Yeah, uh, uh, 100, no, it was not. Uh, R-A-S, <laughs> R-A-S-S-L-I-N. <laughs> Which, it, would make, it would make sense on why the spelling was wrong if Glenn wrote it out. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, one Saturday night, I was like, I have nothing to do. I'm like, let me go check this out. So I walk in and it's in the flea market, it's way in the back. And I had no idea what to expect. I had never, ever been to an indie show. I had only been to the Spectrum or I went to like, you know, um, Garden State Racetrack with the closed circuit TV to watch WrestleMania with my buddies. 
And uh, I walked in and I was, the matches started. And I was sitting there and I just started laughing to myself. I'm like, this is the shittiest stuff I've ever seen in my life. What the <laughs> hell is going on around here? There's no hey, production. No matter, how, how old were you? I was, so this was 93. I was 22. Okay. So you're a young man and you, but you realize this is terrible. Yeah, this is awful. Um, and then for some odd reason, after the matches, I hung around and Glenn and I started talking and uh, he was like, oh, you should come and try well, out. Was Glenn one this- of the matches that you said <laughs> yeah. was just terrible? This is great. This is great. You just said, this is the shittiest wrestling I've ever seen. And that's how I met Glenn. <laughs> and, Glenn and Glenn was the main event because he was the heavyweight champ. So, yes. <laughs> Um, you know, Glenn, Glenn's whole thing was his entrance with the silly string, which we made a lot of money on later on. So it's all good. Um, but yeah, so Glenn and I started talking afterwards, but at this point I was, I don't know, I was lucky to be 180 pounds and I guns like, Oh, you should come down and try out again. I was at college. I had no idea what I was going to do. I was just in college because that's what we were supposed to do. And I'm four years into a a junior college, still not knowing what I was going to do. So um, I said to Glenn, I said, well, it was the summer. I said, let me, you know, try to put some weight on. And he said to me, he goes, no, the best time to learn is as you're putting weight on, you should come and try out. So I was like, all right. So I went the next week and I think Larry had five or six of us trying out and it happened to be in front of his stepdaughter's um, class. They did a class trip to the Monster Factory. And Larry said to us, he goes, I'm only taking a couple. I don't take everybody. And I thought he was full of shit when he said that but um yeah he accepted two of us and i was one of them and um from there that's how i got involved with the school so my similar but i just i started wrestling in high school at uh ninth grade my freshman year uh and i only did it because my older brother uh i was on the basketball team and i was uh starting for the uh jv team as a freshman so he came up to me and he goes oh you're only playing basketball because you can't do a real sport like wrestling because he wrestled in high school. So I quit basketball and I went out for wrestling and I was on the JV team as a freshman. And I just, I, I really, you know, enjoyed the, the self-competition and stuff like that. But I was never, you know, a huge wrestling fan when I was growing up. I used to watch, I used to go over to my aunt's house to watch Spectrum Wrestling when it was over at, the Philadelphia Spectrum, and it was on closed circuit cable TV called Prism. Um, so what would they do? It. Live? What, what would they do? The live it, live event? It, it that was night? Like, they they, they yeah, would it tape it. Month. Yeah, they would tape it every month, and then a the week later, they would show it on like the local cable yeah. channel, well, like and, local, local Spectrum cable. So yeah, yeah, and it was it was funny because my buddy and I would always try to do something to get near the ring entrance. There was one time we took cardboard boxes. And we took that contact paper and wrapped around and made them look like two by four. So when Hacksaw would come out, we could be on the screen holding these stupid things up, yelling, ho. Oh, and then as soon as we saw the red light on us, we drop them and we're like this in the camera, flipping <laughs> everybody off. And then boom, the, pen, the camera, would, it was our way to get on TV locally when we knew everybody was watching it at home. So, <laughs> so I would go over my aunt and watch it you know, once a month and stuff like that. So I was never really interested in it. And then I went through, uh, I did a tournament for high school. It was called the AAUs. And it was up at Paulsboro High School. And right across the street was Larry Sharp's original Monster Factory. And it was right on the port. It was an old deli. So the roof, I mean, you could stand in the middle of the ring and just touch the roof like this. It was crazy small. There was nothing off the top row. No, you know, snap suplexes. That's all they did. So I was looking in the window. I was curious. So I looked in the windows and stuff like that, never really had anything. So then, um, you know, after high school, Larry had a thing because I played football uh, also in high school. So Larry would send a flyer, like a postcard to all the graduating seniors to try to drum up business. So I had this postcard, I set it on my refrigerator and stuff like that and said, oh, that would be cool. So I went to actually a computer school over in Philadelphia and uh, I learned how to do uh, computer operations on mainframes and stuff like that. So I was like 19 years old, 20 years old, and I was working nine at night to seven o'clock in the morning. And it was no, I didn't like it. I didn't enjoy it. So I would call Larry's number on the on the postcard, and he would answer the phone. <laughs> and he would scream so loud, I'd be like, <laughs> and I'd hang up the phone. I had to do that. Like for a month straight, and I just kept like hanging up the phone. And he probably was sitting on the other end going, Who in the hell keeps hanging up on me? So then I decided, So that's how he answered the phone all the time? 
love it. He would scream it. It was crazy. It was, moisturize, dude, you moisturize. What can I do for you? <laughs> it, was, it was the most, it was, it was bizarre. So I went up there one, one time. That's how Gerald right Briscoe still answers the phone. Yeah, I believe it. Only Larry's a little bit more polite than I am. (laughs) So I went up there one time for it, and it was offering tryouts and stuff like that. So I went up there, and I walk into this little tiny, it looks like a deli shop, and there's all these lights and cameras and stuff like that, and I see, like, you know, the the pit bulls are are in there. Um, You know, all these other guys. Johnny Hotbody was in there, which was Johnny Polo, which came out to be Raven. Um, was all in there, and they were, had all these cameras and stuff like that. So then they took, there was like nine of us that went up, and then we all went in there, and we, you know, ran the ropes. They didn't tell you the right way to run the ropes. They would show you how to do all the basic bumps, and then he would take one one by one into the office. And I saw guy after guy. I had the guy that was right before me. I'll never forget it. He goes, there's no way I'm not getting in. I have $3,000 cash, and that's how much the school costs. And he's going to take, he comes out, and he goes, he told me no. I said, are you serious? So I went in there and I said, listen, before you say anything, I was 170 pounds when I tried out. I said, let me go gain all this weight and, you know, so I can get bigger. Because back then, that's when Big John Stud, Andre the Giant, you know, all the big guys were in there, not, you know, medium-sized guys. He was like, kid, it's a lot easier to teach you how to do all these hips, jumps, and flips like that at 190 than it is at 220. So then later on, I said the same thing to Chad. <laughs> so that's how I got involved. And then six months after I, I joined the, the school, um, I went over to Giant Baba for Japan. That was my first overseas experience. Is the Nasty so Boys that, that was signed. right off the bat almost. Right yeah. off the bat. Wow. The Nasty Boys got signed to Vince, and they were looking for just, you know, a, 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 I guess a generic tag team. And it was me and this other guys, and we went over as, the favorite brothers, Frankie and Johnny favorite. And you know, needless to say, he got hurt within the first couple of days and I stayed through. I wrestled Abdul the Butcher, the original Kamala, uh, everything. So at 190 was, uh, pounds. Well by then I was about two twenty. I was oh, about two twenty by then. So yeah. Who, who were you working for in Japan? Uh Baba, Giant Baba. Yeah. Oh, Giant Baba. Oh yeah, my yeah. goodness. So yeah. I was over there with Stan Hansen, Danny Spivey, you know. Giant Baba, Kamala, Abdul the Butcher, and you know everybody knows Abdul the Butcher in Japan is like God over there. Right. So it was it was definitely a you know a, a, an eye opening experience for for somebody that's you know so green in the business and stuff like that. The Fantastics were over there. That was my first really initial look into tag teams was the Fantastics. Did so. you go over for the tag team tournament? No, it was just a regular. It was during, I, I believe, it was the, during the month of December. Um, we were over there during that time. Yeah, and and what point did you guys decide that we want to, you want to form a tag team? It was weird because I was always interested in the tag team from that point. So when I came back to um, the states and everything else, and uh, I told Larry, I said, you know, I'm really interested in tag team. He's like, kid, listen. He goes. For a tag team, there's one, maybe two matches on a card. He goes, it's twice as hard to book a tag team than it is to book a singles wrestler. He goes, stay singles, you'll be fine. And, you know, at the shows once a month, Larry would bring in, like, you know, Jim Cornette. He would bring in, you know, Larry. um, Lawler. Jerry Lawler and, you know, all, all these other guys that he would bring in that we would get experience with and stuff like that. So Lawler always gave me an open invitation to go down to the USWA. And I never wanted to do it because it was I was by myself. So then when Chaz came in, I just, you know, I tried it for so many years by myself, John, and it just, it wasn't happening. So I said, you know what, what do I have to lose? Nothing really. So Chaz came down and it was just, it was just a perfect, it was just we, like a, a perfect mixture. We, we got along so well. I mean, literally right off the bat. I mean, I was down there training for three weeks when, Glenn said to me, he goes, hey, WWF's coming to town. That's when they would tape superstars and challenge. And uh, when they would come down in that area, they would use Larry's guys. So Glenn said to me, hey, you know, they're going to be here. He's like, come, you know, you're going to go. And I was like, go. I don't even know how to bump yet. Like, three weeks. It's like, he's like, no, no. He's like, don't worry about it. They won't use you. He goes, you're going to go. You'll see everybody. They'll see you. You'll get paid. Don't worry about it. And uh, they rolled out the whiteboard 
and there was my name, Chaz Ware versus Adam Bomb. And I went, what the <laughs> fuck? I was like, are you kidding me? And then the next night it was, um, it was Papa. It was Godfather. It was Papa Shango the second night. Wow. And uh, I mean, just from that first us being away two or three days, I mean, from there, we were almost, I hate to use the term inseparable, but we hung out. I mean, we lived 10 minutes away from one another. His ex at the time and my ex, my ex-girlfriend, then um, they they got along. Um, so the whole thing just kind of just fell into place from there. And then when, you know, Glenn said to me when he brought up the tag thing, you know, three, four months later, I mean, Glenn was, and you guys are going to chuckle at this, Glenn down at the school was the man. I mean, he ran the school. Everyone, everyone wanted to be around Glenn, wanted something to do with him. Things um, never I mean, changed. Now, it's, now it's, a, it's a little different now. But. <laughs> so, um, so it was like, well, hell yeah, I'll try this tag thing. And then we, we started as the Spiders. And the funny part is we did a show and I had the mask on. And it was the first show we did at the school, at the Monster Factory. And Glenn's mom came up to me and she starts talking to me. We literally had a 15 minute conversation and she thought she was talking to Glenn the whole time. I'm like, you realize I'm not Glenn, right? She was like, are you fucking kidding me? And I'm like, no. <laughs> so, I mean, we got along so well. The first time I actually met his mom, she walked up to me and he's like, hey, mom, this is Chad. Chad, this is my mom. As I stood up, she slapped me in the face. And, I, and I'm like, what the fuck? And she goes, I heard you're just like Glenn, so that's probably for all the stuff either you're going to do or you've done in the past that you haven't been slapped for. So I was like, all right, fair enough. And, and here's the funny thing. If she would have known all the stuff that we did get into, she probably would have hit him with a bat. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Glenn, I'm going to give you a chance here, an opportunity, a golden opportunity. How was uh, how was Chaz's training class after he said he witnessed the worst professional wrestling show? <laughs> how was his training class? Well, he never said that to me until today. <laughs> so, so, no, it was uh, it, it was weird too because I remember when I, I first when he first came in, I had to drop the belt as the heavyweight champ, but I, I think I was injured. I did something wrong with my shoulders or something like that, and we dressed him up in the spider outfit, and he actually lost my. Monster Factory heavyweight title for me the one time. So yeah. So, yeah. Indeed, I mean, so he had it. So he had a decent class going. Is what yeah, yeah. And yeah. You, you always were the politician of the two. I got because to... because when 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 I finally got him to to go up to the WWF at the time and um, do the jobs and stuff like that, I said, "Man, it's great. We go up there, we meet everybody, and it's so much fun. We travel." You know, it's, it's a good foot in the door. And it was so funny because everybody always told me, you know, coming up in the restaurant, you're going to be on TV doing jobs. That's, that's bad. Don't do that. Don't do that. And it was funny because Larry always, you know, instilled in us that it was a lot harder making it look believable, getting your ass kicked than kicking somebody's ass. So, you know, I always, I loved going up there and, and, you know, being with the guys and stuff like that. And, you know, it, I don't know if it helped us, Later on, it had it helped. I, no, I it definitely, you, uh, yeah. it definitely helped because um, kind of how we got our, our first contract, which was a part-time deal, and I know we're jumping way ahead, but the part-time deal was through Cornette, and Cornette's the one who came up with the headbanger idea. He gave us the idea, we ran with it, but this is when right after Smokey closed, and um, he was with Vince, and he said to Vince, "Hey." Um, I got these two guys I, I'd like you to look at. And Vince was like, well, tell me about them. So Cornette started talking about us. And he was like, wait a minute. And he goes, they're the Spiders, right? And Cornette was like, yeah. He's like, yeah, I know who they are. Just put them under the part-time contract. Vince so Kennedy McMahon knew the Spiders? He knew the Spiders. <laughs> wow. According to Cornette. <laughs> According to Cornette. Well, wait, we actually did a job or two. I think we yeah. did a job to the As the Spiders. As the Spiders. As well, a, we, the how, did, how did the name Spiders, because it's a unique name, but did, did you have well, a, it's, it's Spiders? Funny. Or, 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 okay, well, tell us the story it, how the Spiders came So, So Glenn was the original Spider, so he was the Spider. So I came in. So I came in. Help as, me, help me. Oh, that was a fly. At least, at least, for, at least with the Monster Factor. Um, so I came in as Spider 2, and we came up with this name called the Arachnoids. We're like, we're going to be the arachnoids. We had it put on the, the, the tights, the whole thing. We went to USWA. What the hell is that? 
Well, that's what I'm getting to. We go Wait a minute, Jerry, you live by the bumblebee <laughs> down there in Florida. That's right. <laughs> they didn't At least we didn't have no, uh, uh, what were they, hunchback. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So we, we get the TV at USWA, and Lawler comes up to us, and he says, he goes, so what's the name? And we're like, the arachnoids. And he goes, the what? We're like, he goes, no one in Memphis, Tennessee is going to know what the fuck an arachnoid is. He goes, you're the spiders. And we went, okay. So we were the spiders. <laughs> so it was funny because I got the original name from Larry and um, Larry told me a story. He goes, you know, he goes, you're built just like this guy that, that used to wrestle back when Larry first started as the spider. And I'm like, okay. He's like, you know, he played semi-pro baseball or he played pro, pro baseball for, you know, a while and then he wrestled on the off season and he wore a mask. Does anybody know who it is? Well, I do, but I know because <laughs> no. you've heard this Randy Savage. And he was at Lanny Poffo. Or yeah. not Lanny, but my Oh, you Randy. know, I, I have heard that story. I, I didn't I didn't yeah. put two and two together, but yeah, yeah, I have heard yeah. that story. Yeah, goes, of course. You have the same body type and everything else, and I was like, Oh my god, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want. Yeah, tell me more. <laughs> tell me more. Yeah. You said that I'm like, like you want another savage? beer? Oh my god! <laughs> so yeah, so I I had the the original name first, and then when light or when Chaz came in, it was just easy turned into the spiders, uh, arachnoids, and you know arachnophobia and stuff like that. So okay. so it was, was cool. savage? Was savage? Did savage wrestle as a spider? Yeah, he wrestled as a spider. He wore a black mask. What so, what territory was that? Was he in? Uh, I want to say Min uh, Minneapolis, I think. You know, Jerry? No, I don't. I was trying to think of the same. Uh, was that when uh, they had the but, territory? It wasn't when they had the territory. Probably Minneapolis. If he was still playing ball, so it, it had to be that early day. Because down here, he was playing ball, and we always had him as, as Randy Poffo because Angela was so hot down here. Yeah. Right. Because yeah, Angela had the territory in Memphis, right? And not Memphis. I'm sorry. Mississippi. 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 Yeah, I want to think it was Minneapolis that we wore the, the, the black hood. It was weird because it had a, a weird nose to it. Or, and it was, yeah. But so did you was, do spider things? Yeah, we, you, my finish is I jumped off the top rope and I went for a splash, but I spun around in a circle so I came down like that. And I would go to the ring and I would have that silly string and I would spray it around and it looked like your webs. So, you know, when me and Chaz got together, we went to a party store and we used to buy... The silly string by the case. Cases. And cases and cases of it. And we would sell it at the, the Monster Factory for like $5 a thing. And people would just buy it to spray on us and the other people. We were making so much money on just reselling the silly string. Larry never thought to pay us. He was like, you guys are making way too much money just on your gimmicks. And now you guys <laughs> all that shit up. So yeah, and he said, you guys were, were successful. He decided he wasn't paying you. Yeah, yeah, he didn't care. Yeah. It, was, it was part of, you know, putting in your time, you know, and stuff like that, paying your dues. It was all about, it was all about selling tickets. Before we started tagging, I had uh, a couple of like singles matches with one of the other guys at the school. Um, again, I was local. I lived there and we did um, two Broadways, first two matches, September, October, both like 15 minute uh, Broadways. And then the third match comes up in November and Larry goes, all right. He goes, we're having a loser leaves town match. He goes, <laughs> Whoever sells the most tickets doesn't leave town. And he plops <laughs> two piles of tickets in front of us. And the other guy, his name was Craig. He goes, the fuck? I live in Ohio. Chaz lives down the street. And Larry goes, I don't know what to tell you, kid. He goes, but this is the rules. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Jerry, is that how you book Florida? Uh, uh, similar, yeah. you know, uh, here, here, here in Florida, if you're on TV, if you, if you won, you didn't get paid. If you did a job, you got 25 bucks. <laughs> I'll job all night long. Yeah. We, were, we were in Austria one time and it was the year before I got there. I, but the, the guys all told me guy goes into auto and he demands a race. He's like, I'm over here working in Europe and I, I got to have a race. And the auto goes, you know, I cannot give you a raise, but, uh, I'll give you a title. The guy goes, okay, okay. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was so funny because when we went down to Memphis and we started wrestling as the fighters, you know you were making $40 a night there. Yeah. So me and Chaz were like, oh, man, we've got to really sell gimmicks and push gimmicks. So we went out and it was just so, it was so stupid. We got foam, like we were carpet foam, and we took an outline of a big giant spider and we glued it uh, like a, a, on a, a paint, paint stick. stick. The paint star. And we just paint the whole thing black and then we would take it and they would sell it for like five bucks. 
and it costs us like, I don't know, 50 cents a dollar to make. And so we're selling them and we're selling out of them every single night. And what was it in um, Nashville where we were told that we weren't allowed to sell them anymore. And the next thing we go out, we see these foam crowns from Jerry Lawler. <laughs> All of them got foam crowns made. <laughs> yeah, and then the next week we had a loser leaves town match also. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, let, let, let me ask this: Is you guys are Jersey guys? You grew up, you grew up in and in, in, in like in Philadelphia wrestling. How in the heck did you miss the ECW trend? What what happened there? So here's what happened: Is we. We actually left Memphis, and while we were in Memphis, we got friendly with Axel and Ian, the Rotten Brothers. Um, they lived with us for a little while when we were there, and we all kind of left at the same time. What year was that? That was 90, so it was 94. Yeah. Okay, because they, they came was, down They came down to Texas when Crockett tried to open back up uh, with the Sportatorium, and I can't remember if they were there for Crockett. I don't think they were. I think they were there before when Greg Pearson owned it and was running it. And they were there. They lived in the same uh, apartment complex as, as me and Bobby Dunkel, which was yeah. We, we Axel, actually came Axel had which been was past, for a while. which was past the hood. You went, we actually, you went to the hood, and then you went to like the really bad part where me and Bobby. <laughs> <lived>. <laughs> we actually wrestled in the, in uh, Dallas Auditorium as the Spiders against uh, Sam Houston and Chaz. Chaz oh Taylor. yeah, yeah, uh, Tugboat's yeah. kid. Uh, the, yeah. the Texas, yep. Texas tugboat kids. Yeah. 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 So, but we were there cause we weren't USWA. We went there in April of 94 and then we were gone that, that summer. Um, so it was during that summer when Axel called us and he said, Hey, we're going up to ECW. Why don't you guys come up? And we went up and we, we wrestled them. Um, we put them over, we wrestled them as the spiders. We put them over. And then, um, so we, we were scheduled to go back and then there was, I don't know if this story is 100% accurate or not, but there was heat between, from what I understand, between Paulie and Larry. And he had made a comment about us being Larry's boys and watch how he was going to fuck with us. Um, at the same time, during that time, I got um, what's called a polydimal cyst right on my tailbone. They used to call it um, Jeep seat because the younger kids used to get it thinking to bounce around in the Jeeps that were in the military. But I mean, it was the worst pain I've ever had in my life. It laid me out. Yeah, um, so we ended up call them herpes. Oh, hurt my, you know. yeah, but there's a cure for it now. Call, so. call it whatever you want. Man. <laughs> uh, but between between here and the, that rumor and, and then the cyst I had, and I had to take a couple weeks off because I had to get it, you know, taken care of. We we missed the next booking, and then just we just never went back. Um, it's probably the one and only time because we were actually driving to the show, and I couldn't sit. I was in the car like this. I was like, "What the fuck? Like, what's going on?" I just couldn't sit still. It was so much. What pain. causes it? Um, it's just one of those weird things. It just happens. It's literally right on your tailbone. Yeah. It's just one of those things. Um, yeah. So we ended up missing the booking and then we just, we never went back. And then, um, then we ended up going back out to Arkansas for Burt Prentice. He opened up, um, in Arkansas. So we were there for, I don't know, a year and a half. And then we went to Smoky Mountain, um, after that. And then, so we kind of missed the whole thing because we went and did other stuff. And then right after that is when we, you know, we signed with Vince. Okay, hey, you're your arrival at Smoky Mountain. I, I I either saw this or read this last night as I was looking you guys up. And it was the strangest thing I've ever heard in my life. I hope one of you can clear it up. When oh, you geez. got to the headbanger name, Jim Cornette suggested a headbanger because he had been to a heavy metal concert. Now, so, come on, Jim, not, Jim Cornette yeah. at a heavy metal concert. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so not only was it a heavy metal concert, it was in New York. He was actually in New York, uh, but he was he was My there. God. <laughs> he was he was at a Glenn Danzig concert. And that's where Who's he got the idea. Yeah, I know. He's, he's a heavy metal. I know who he is. I knew who he was because yeah, I used he, to go with my friends over in Philly. How in the hell did the Cornette land up there? Yeah, how, and, uh, is Cornette a heavy metal fan? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I, I don't, don't think, think so either, well. but he came back and he told us that. We both like looked at each other like, you're a yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, I got to be. Really there. Yeah, and then he told us about the idea of, of you know the the mosh pits and the, the slam dance and the spitting the, the the dresses the makeup the this and i was like i know exactly what you're talking about i mean i've been to mosh pits i've done it um i knew exactly what you're talking about and then he said yeah he goes there's this really crazy guy with fishnets and makeup on long hair turns out it was marilyn manson Manzo. opening for, for glenn danzig so that's where Cornette came up with the idea and that's what he told us um when he called us he said 
I don't like the masks. He goes, but I have this idea. <laughs> he goes, I don't want you guys to go get piercings and get more tattoos yeah, and yeah. do all that stuff. <laughs> he goes, just uh so I mean we took it to Watch the your extreme with all of it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And see, yeah, so you had to cancel thing. all your appointments. <laughs> we already had all that stuff. We already had the tattoos and the piercings and stuff like that. We listened to that type of music. And it was just it was just so funny because he wanted to call us Mosh and Slasher. And we were like, Jim, you know there's a guy in a band called Slash, right? He was like, All right, Slasher then. So that's how he came up with the names. And Chad was like, I'll take Mosh. And I regret it to this day because it takes me twice as long to write my name. So it, it was it was just, <laughs> it, it was it was funny. It was it was just so weird that you know. And then when we started down in Smokey, we actually took the place of um, the gangsters. Um, so they didn't. They were supposed to finish off, and we were supposed to come in as they were finishing off. So we walk into the building one day for TV and. Uh, I guess uh, New Jack looks at Cornette and he goes, the fuck are these guys? Huh. He goes, well, you guys are finishing up, so we're bringing them in. He goes, fuck you, we quit. And they left. That's how, that's how <laughs> And then left. Cornette, it was great because we were supposed to do four weeks of TV and yeah. then come back and start doing, you know, the start, doing the, the, start doing the house shows and the loops. Cornette turns his head, he looks at us, he goes, Guess you guys are on the house shows now. We were like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> hey, were, you, we were, were you guys there? I'm sorry to bring you this. I'm, I'm going crazy, skipping around. Were you guys there when Jamie Dundee and his partner and Wolfie D quit? Uh, no, so anyway, they, 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 I'm sorry, brought up New Jack quitting on the spot. No, the but they, been there. Jamie Man brought the finish. They, they wanted be, to put over the Road Warriors, and Jamie Dundee <laughs> decided he would quit over it, but. He went out there and put him over and got over like a million dollars. I mean, it was awesome. He was doing this kung fu stuff, and they turned around. I remember around this. And Hawk and Animal would kill him. It was it was one of the most entertaining matches. And then when he got back, he quit. Yeah, I remember that. Yes. <laughs> remember that? And we yes, all I say, do remember if, it now. if you're going to quit, quit yeah. before you do the job. Before you do the job. <laughs> <laughs> Not after. And especially he went out there and had just a hell of a match with, with, the, with the Road Warriors. And then right. quit. Man, quit. Wow. <laughs> no, I, I do remember that. That's funny. It's actually because of those two, how we ended up with the skirts. Because that's when they were big in Memphis. Um, PG-13 skirts, big in skirts Memphis. were big in Memphis? <laughs> no. Uh, PG-13 what, what part of Memphis? <laughs> <laughs> Jerry's, Jerry's backyard. I mean, uh, wait a minute. What the hell? Jerry's pool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, we went out the first time with Smoky Mountain and we were just wearing shorts and Cornette gave us, um, I had a Slayer t-shirt. He gave Glenn a Metallica t-shirt and that's what we wore. But that's basically what PG-13 wore was sneakers and shorts. So I was like, we need to do something different. So we went to the thrift store and we're walking around trying to figure out something to wear. And I walked down the women's aisle and I saw this skirt I and I just did. put it on it. And okay. I walked out, I walked out and Glenn's like, no. And I go, yes. He goes, no, I go. Let's just try it. I go, what's the worst thing? Roddy Piper wore one. <laughs> right, we raised two dollars and fifty cents because I don't right. cost our whole gimmick probably cost us eight dollars. <laughs> so yeah, so we went, we bought skirts, we went to one of the, the smoky shows, we put them on, and everybody in the locker room, Tracy Smothers, Dirty White Boy, Buddy Land Editor, they're all like, the fuck are you guys doing? We're like trying oh, wait, to wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Were they were they actual skirts or were they were they killed? It was a skirt. No, no they're skirts. Skirt. Oh, was a regular okay. Wow. Yeah, it was a skirt. Um, and I think does I think that change one... your mind, Jerry? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I wear those. You heard? I wear it till wait a minute. I wore an evening gown. So. <laughs> That's right. You had an evening gown match with Pat. Um, well, the funny. night we won the, the night we won the titles, we were actually wearing wedding gowns. We just dyed them black. <laughs> we wore full <laughs> wedding gowns. Um, yeah, so we we went out there. We got so much heat from the skirts, and then that Bible Belt area right there. We came in the back. Cornette was like, "Where'd you get the skirts?" We're like thrift store he handed us each 20 dollars. he goes go buy more he goes you're wearing skirts now we went okay <laughs> like we just we were happy because we went from you know memphis making 40 bucks a night burt prentice making lucky if we made three dollars a night to actually making a guarantee of 75 whole dollars a night so we were like whatever you want us to do <laughs> we're in i can't imagine why skirts guys wearing skirts will get the heat in the, in the mountains of kentucky or tennessee <laughs> yeah. exactly exactly <laughs> But it was great, and I'll, I'll be honest, it's the most comfortable thing I've ever wrestled in. <laughs> <laughs> the Burt Prentice, the, he was 
he ran like a million different territories, didn't he? I mean, he was always running a different territory and starting up and trying to do this or trying to do that, but he never really did he, well, did he? Well, he, he he did well to a certain extent, and then we we found out when we were with him in, in Arkansas for um, Ozark Mountain, he got to a certain point, and then the city ran dry of money. Then he would pick up the territory and move to another city to try and dry them out of money because he literally, with, with his spot, he was great at selling the product and the sponsorships. He'd get something local on TV. And then he would, you know, he was keep because he wasn't paying us. Hell, we did. I did a cage match one night uh, with Colorado Kid. I got color. I got the whole nine yards. And I, it's the biggest house we had. It, the, the place, the little building was the biggest house. There had to be, I don't know, 100 people there, which back then was huge. And he gives me an envelope. And I open it up. And there was a post-it in there. It said, pay off $5.00. Minus a dollar for a hot dog, dollar for soda. There was three dollars in nickels and dimes in the envelope. Wow. And I looked at Glenn. I'm like, I understand paying dues, but we finally got a house, and this is what we get. It was like, what the <laughs> fuck? <laughs> That's what Bert did. That, 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 was, that was his payoff. There, you know, I've had some strange payoff. I've had the the the, the nickels and the, and the dimes and and the pennies and payoffs. But you know, that was that was my very first payoffs and stuff like that. I can't imagine being on the road like you said and getting a house and all of a sudden you, you you're working for this guy and you get you got a pocket full of change well, for yeah yeah how, how, did, how did he keep the talent around there let's clarify the house first <laughs> <laughs> so the one thing that you know we went to bird after we left um when we met ricky and robert so they always told us that you know when you get into a territory you find the biggest heaviest girl you can find because you're not <laughs> going to get paid much but they're always going to eat so you're always eating. So <laughs> it was funny because when we left Memphis, we went over to Bert and he was running the Ozarks, Ozark Mountain. And we found these two twins, Wilba and Wilma, God bless them. <laughs> and they were infatuated. Do we need that. to put a disclaimer up here now? <laughs> maybe. Maybe. Well, how, how long is the statue of limitation? <laughs> were, they, were they big? Uh, so yeah. one was no, so no, yeah. Which one was? They it? were, they were, they were twins. The only way you could tell them apart is one had teeth and one did not. That's yeah. how you could True. tell them apart. So um, they, they were, actually, they, they were the house. How they house. So that's what you mean by we finally got a house. We finally yeah. got home set in there. Right. Yeah, <laughs> they were, they were probably sixty-ish, fifty years old. Oh yeah, yeah. they were. And you oh, guys were what teenagers? Close to it, yeah. <laughs> I mean, tw I mean, 24, 23, 24. And there was one time they started getting a little touchy feely with us, and I was like, "That's no, always our cabin where you guys are at, man." Yeah, I mean, I'm like, we, we I'm like, we, I'm like we, we can't have this. So Glenn had a mattress just on the floor, and I had a bed. And we hear them pull up, and they thought because they rented a house, they had car blanche, they could just come in and come and go as they please. So they I said, Glenn, I go, I said, Glenn, I go, hurry up, get, get in here. He's like, what? I go, get in bed. He goes, what do you mean? Get in bed. I go, get in bed with me. And he goes like, why? I go, just get in the fucking bed. So he gets in the bed and I got my arm around him like this. And it, it's, it's like, we're cuddling. <laughs> they walk down the hall to the bedroom. They're like, oh, we're like, well, what the fuck? You caught us. What are you doing? So we basically <laughs> told them we were gay lovers and that's how they never touch us again. But they kept buying us stuff, so it was amazing. They would make a dinner. They would bring dinner for us and just leave it on the thing and then leave. Yeah. Was, then it was the most leave, bizarre thing ever. We did. We wear leave. your did you wear your skirts in, in the house at home? No. no we were the spiders back then. Yeah, get, yeah, that was, was, get real, spiders. get real, Briscoe. I would wear skirts. <laughs> yeah, we were we were still the spiders back then. Yeah, but it was great. We'd put laundry out front and they would come over to the house. They'd take the laundry, they would wash it for us. We'd come back and they would just, after that, they just put it on the steps. But so, they'd still, so we'd meet them after the Who was it? Was it John Ritter that played, uh, you know, Don Knotts was the landlord in the company com where he pretended Reed's to be company. Company. so he could yes. live with the two girls? Yes. So yeah, that, that's kind of what you guys did to yeah, pretend. That's not kind of. That's exactly what we did. <laughs> <laughs> well, good save, John. Good save. <laughs> and here, here's the funniest thing is Larry would tell us all these road stories and everything else. And me and Chaz would be sitting in the locker room going, this guy is full of shit. This stuff never happened. And then we get out on the road and go, oh, my God. Not only did it happen, it was happening to us. And it was like. Like tenfold, it was mag. It was so much farther than what we could ever believe. It was crazy. 
So yeah, did first, they ever try to get weekend. romantic with you again? Nope. No. Nope. No. Never again. They just, they just assumed that you were an idol. Yeah. yeah, and they just and then we'd hang out with them. Like after shows, we'd we'd hang out with them at the gas station while they were putting gas in our car, <laughs> or, or walking into the store and buying us food, and then we would leave. Did you guys yeah. ever have the suite for any of those other girls around the, around the territory, though? No, no, not really. You didn't want to expose your gimmick. No, <laughs> <laughs> I, I meant that. I meant that, and not the way you think it, John. <laughs> oh yes, you did. We know exactly what you were talking thinking about. <laughs> We've been around so, you a so little too long. After, after, yeah. you get caught, after you get caught in bed together. How did you keep having to keep this charade up? Like, did you have to hold hands in public or anything? No, they just never, they just never went down that road again. They just, w when they would come over, they would come over, they, they would, would either pick up the laundry or drop food off, and they would just leave. They would never come that well, far they, back into and, the house. And when they did come into the house, they started knocking. So we were, they, <laughs> before they would just barge in. But then they started knocking. So it was like, oh, this is how we set up our boundaries. So how did you get hooked up with them that they started buying you food and put them in your house? They put they were they house. were they were fans. fans. They were yeah. local fans. And uh, one time we went, it was le legit. We got done doing a show and we stopped to get gas. And Glenn and I were standing out there with probably dollars and nickels trying to figure out, okay, how much can we put gas in the car and grab something to eat? at a little convenience store, you know, to get us home and grab a snack. And they were like, you guys, okay. You know, that was a good match, blah, blah, blah. And they were like, yeah, you know, Bert doesn't fucking pay us. And we just, we were in that mood. We just started dumping on him about Bert. And they were like, he doesn't pay you. We're like, no, like this is part of paying dues. And they're like, why do you keep doing it? And we're like, well, we get to, you know, be on a, you know, we get to wrestle five or six nights a week. Like if we, we went home, spoon, basically, <laughs> you know, we wouldn't be able to, um, <laughs> So they were like, oh, that's so sad. Well, here, let us get you some gas. And here, come inside. We'll buy you some groceries. Wow. And then literally after every show, they'd meet us out back. And they're like, you guys need gas? You need food or anything? And so we were like, fuck yeah, Ricky was right. You find the biggest ones in the territory because they always <laughs> eat. We're like, let's go. <laughs> we found them. And that was one of the things. He goes, and you never sleep with them. He goes, if you sleep with them, it messes it all up. He goes, And, and they were both married. Or one was married to a guy that worked in the government. It would, he was on a ship or something out to so sea or bizarre. something. He was never home. <laughs> so bizarre. <laughs> was the breakup heartbreaking for either one of the four of you? When, when um, you had a, had no, a because, <laughs> no, here's here's what we did. When we left, there was a ceiling fan. <laughs> and we took... <laughs> this is fucking terrible. We took, we took cheesecake and we put it on the ceiling fan. So when they came in, they turned it on. <laughs> the ceiling fan whipped around. <laughs> No. Yeah, we were already we were already gone. Cheesecake everywhere. <laughs> so you didn't even tell them you guys were leaving. You just no. You, you give me the um, apartment and left. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. We didn't yeah. trash it that bad. We didn't trash true, it. True, true hills, true hills, hills to the very end. There. It was bad. Did they ever try to track you down? No. no, 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 no. They just yeah, got hit with cheesecake got, from the ceiling fan. That, that's it. But back then, <laughs> they're probably like this. You know, oh, come on. They're, they're two they're two tenants who like each other that they're very disappointed about just left. Yeah, but back then there was, there was no social media. So I mean, how do you I mean we had beepers? We had the calling cards on the on I don't even think we had a beeper then. We, I mean, there, there was no way of getting a, no cell phones back then, no nothing like that. I mean it was crazy. <laughs> I'll be back in one second. I'm about to pee my pants. Okay. Oh, <laughs> that's going to get a cheesecake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I mean, it was bizarre. I mean, when when I tell you that they did everything for us, they would pay for our traffic tickets. You know, we get a speeding ticket, they would pay for it. We would just hand them the ticket. They would go down to the courthouse and pay for it. It was it was the most. Wow. Who, who were so, who were some ever. of the guys in the territory at that time? It was just a bunch of local guys. Uh, the only, you know. Uh, Jack or um, Mankind, Cactus Jack, he would come down. You know, he was, I think he was between uh, WCW and, and WWF, his first run at the time. He would come down, and but there was never really anybody that was a name. Nobody really, I don't think anybody, you know, came out of that area. You know, the Ozark, you know, when he had Ozark Mountain Wrestling. Right. Chaz, do you remember anybody that, that came out of Ozark Mountain Wrestling besides, you know, you know, Jack would come down and. Uh, well, so Val Venus was there. 
Oh, that's um, right. That's right. Sean was there with with his partner. Oh, he must, he, Val must have had a ball with uh, with the twins. Uh. They were the. <laughs> they, were, they were ours exclusively. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> the, fe- uh, the, the fences were high. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Shane and Sean came down. They were the Glamour Boys. Um, they were there with us for a little while. Um, he would he would bring over people from Smoky Mountain as well. Yeah, that's yeah. how we ended up in Smoky. Was Tracy came over, Ricky and Robert came over, and then um, they would take you know we'd give them tapes and they would take them back. That's how because of them is how we ended up over there. Well, and Smoky Mountain, who did you guys feud with and all that? Um, so we worked Ricky and Robert a lot. Then we worked Tracy and uh, Dirty White Boy a lot. Um, Dirty White Boy is he, he's a kid that doesn't really get its accolades like he could. I no. should. That guy was fantastic in the ring. Yeah. 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 yeah, especially his T.L. Hopper. That yeah, was fucking Hopper, amazing. Yeah. T.L. Hopper, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, dirty white boy T.L. Hopper, that, that guy goes at it at, I guess. Yeah, we yeah, didn't get T.L. Hopper now. I, he's, I think he's still down in the Knoxville area. Yeah. Yeah, I so, think he's still yeah, there. I yeah, I don't know what he's doing. I saw him do a uh, reunion show or something like that. Hey, he's a plumber him. down there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we never really got into any feuds with Smoky Mountain because we were there for six months and then they put the belt on Tommy Rich and shut down. So I don't know. <laughs> we, we were on an international flight somewhere and T.L. Hopper was sitting right beside me and we're right by the, the bathroom and he goes into the bathroom. He's in there for a little while and just for no other reason, it's not bored. You know, nothing to do on those flights. That's before DVDs and all that stuff. I bang on the door just to, just to mess with him. And the flight attendant comes and she's English and she goes, sir, is there a problem? I said, yeah, my friend has been in there for some time and I think he's in trouble. He's knocking on the door. He's she, knocking and she the says, door. well, I can take the door off the hinges. And then she, I said, ma'am, I think you need to. And, so, <laughs> and she says, sir, is there something wrong? Teal Hopper says something back, but he's got that deep Southern accent and she's English. She can't understand what he says. <laughs> and she goes, what did he say? I said, He's in trouble. He needs help. <laughs> <laughs> but before she can pop the door off the hinges with him in there sitting on the throne, he comes out and he goes, all right, that this is going to be a long flight. <laughs> Fair enough. I like yeah, T.L. Hopper. He was fun. No, nah, Tony was good. Those overseas trips, I never went to the bathroom. I never got up out of my seat. You know, and if you went to the bathroom, now, now you could on a flight because it was, uh, because guys wouldn't, be, wouldn't, you know, lock the door on the flight, but he did it on the bus. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And one time, Brooklyn Brawler was messing with some boys, and he goes in there, and he was in there for like three or four hours. They locked him in with the with the cord and the cable, and <laughs> and there's no air conditioning in those bus. So. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> no ventilation at all. <laughs> so forget, the first the, the first overseas tour I did was when we went to Kuwait. And Jerry, this is all your fault from this point forward, because Jerry has my passport. And that's when he told me I look like leave it to beaver, which led to me being the beef. But he hands me my he hands me my passport back in the plane ticket. And it's first class. And this is my first tour. I we Glenn and I were still part time. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This, this is wrong. I'm like, I should not be in first class. He's like, no, you, it's fine. You, you, listen, it's a seat they gave you. It's no big deal. I'm literally like Sean. Brett, everyone else is in the back. Stone Cold, they're all in the back. And I'm like, no, I'm walking up to them going, guys, just give me your ticket. Like, just switch. I'm thinking I'm going to get the shit ripped out of me. This is bullshit. (laughs) I've been here three fucking minutes and I'm sitting in first class. I'm like, no. So, Jerry, (laughs) you're like, just go. It's fine. I walk on the plane and I look next to me at the seat. It was Ahmed. And I went, fuckers are ridding me now. (laughs) So I got to sit next to Ahmed, who was like this. The entire time in the scene, I was like underneath his arm. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, now I get it. It's okay. <laughs> well, all, forget, all those guys refuse that seat. So that's yes. a- yep. <laughs> I forget I forget where we were going. We were going somewhere overseas and I fell asleep and I fell asleep like this. And I had the ball head and I wake up and Dwayne the Clown makeup is on the back of my head. I think it was um Brawler that did it and stuff like that. Nobody ever admitted to it, but I had to the Doink the Clown painted on the back of my head. It was funny. You know, <laughs> that was the thing back then. If, if you played into the rib and you got upset, you got ribbed all the time. Yeah. We, I mean, Mark Henry was the best one. He would fall into, look at John's face. <laughs> he would fall <laughs> into the ribs and he would get so upset. 
I don't know if John, you remember, but I remember the one when he after he broke his leg, and he's walking in the back, and then Davey and Owen hide his crutches, and then somebody told him, Mark, Vince needs you by ringside. So then I remember seeing him, you know, hopping all the way down the the, the, the ramp and stuff like that on one leg and everything else, and he, he gets halfway there, and you hear Owen go, Never mind, and it was just <laughs> it was just so he, Mark would get so mad. And it was just so, ah, oh, it was so funny. But back then it was just, it was different, man. We had so much fun in the locker rooms. It was. You know, to Mark's credit, to Mark's credit though, you're right about that. When he first came in, because he, he, I don't think yeah. he was expecting it. Somebody yeah. hit one of his shoes one time on a flight. We're going in, I think like to Texas, maybe <laughs> San Antonio. And he never sold it. He just, he walked through, he walked to the airport with one shoe on, one shoe off and never sold it. He and finally well, took it. I but, was, uh, that I was wasn't any sh- fun and just put it back on his suitcase. <laughs> it's funny. I was at, I was at a cigar bar last night and I was talking to, to some guy I know and we were, he, he was asking me stories and it was funny. Mark's name came up and I said, the amazing thing about Mark is he came in green, not knowing anything, getting ribbed the shit out of all the time, but just, eventually was like okay this is what it is this is how it is i'm not going anywhere because we all know the contract he had was you know vince couldn't get out of it so it was like he just accepted it and just kept getting better and better and yeah. better because he you know i was asked about one of the who i was probably in the ring with the most who was like the most dangerous at that point to hurt somebody and back then it was mark because he just didn't know his own strength he was yeah. so strong he would you know, we're used to helping and jumping, and next thing you know, you're flying in the yeah. air. So it was like, you know, we're just going to let Mark just lift me and do whatever he wants because he's going to do it anyway. Well, but he was Mark legitimately one of the himself. strongest men yeah. of all time. Yeah. Yes. I mean, when yeah. you look at his lifts, I mean, it's not just the strongest man right. in the world. He was one of the strongest men yeah, of all time. He was, time. yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the, thing, the thing you said, he did not know his own strength. That guy no. was just, no. you, know, you just go he up and, and touch him, man, and you just knew the power in that guy. We yeah, worked with yeah. Mark a lot. Me and Ron did. I, you know, Mark was great. Mark Mark was such a nice guy. You know, he and, thank good, and thank goodness he was. Thank <laughs> goodness. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, he really hurt somebody. Yeah. Were y'all there when he ripped the locker off the hinges for uh, get Arn Anderson's bag out? No. Oh my oh, goodness. So we're we're in the locker. I think it, I think it was Arn Anderson. I'm sure I'll be corrected on Twitter if it wasn't. But, uh, you know, those high school type lockers that had the combination lock on them, you know, yeah, yep. so we're dressing in there. I think, I think it was Arn. He had put his bag in the locker and it mistakenly closed and it's locked. And so they, they can't get it open. So they got a crowbar. They're trying to open it. They're trying to get the thing done. I'm sitting there by uh, Ron. We're watching all these guys trying to get Arn's bag out. He goes, wait till Mark gets here. So as soon as Mark <laughs> got there, he told Mark, take that locker off. Mark Henry put a towel on the locker and put a towel over the locker itself and, and pulled that locker off its hinges. That's We're incredible. sitting there watching. I mean, that's when he was, that's when he right between the two world strongmen that he won. Right. And we're sitting there watching going, if we've ever offended you, we want to apologize right now. <laughs> because that you was, are, that was one new- of the most single impressive things I've ever seen in my life. It's and like you, went, are now, you are now you are now a member guy. of the APA. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. I said you're the, the new member of the APA now. That's right. That's you right. Sit yeah. right here. Mark, <laughs> you're Mark we weren't looking for a new member. You just we just drafted you. Yeah, you're yeah. with us and, now. You're not against us. He was the, he was the nicest, most sincere guy and just, oh, just yeah, he still was, is. he's great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he yeah. just wanted to learn. He just wanted to yeah. learn. And um he did a hell of a job for himself all yeah, the years. So. And his son is a world-class athlete now. Oh, his son's man. like 17, 18. I, I see Mark yeah, all the time. He's a so- sophomore in high school. What is he, 6'5", about 300 pounds, 285. Wow. wow. Not only, is he, great, so well, not only is he one of, the, one of the best football <laughs> players in the state of Texas, but he's one of the best high school wrestlers in the state of Texas also. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why he got good genetics. His dad was just one of the strongest <laughs> men that's ever walked on the planet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you look at Mark's lifts. I mean, I saw where they're looking at like the strongest man who've ever lived, not just in recent times. Mark Henry is up in the in the top of the strongest men who ever lived. Wow. By the way, they do rankings and all this different yeah, stuff. 100%. You know, it, it, oh, yeah. Right. Pretty freaking impressive. Yeah, yeah. no, that's crazy. Yeah. Thank so you, so nice. you guys, you guys, are, are <laughs> thank goodness, head, yes. you, guys, you guys are the headbangers in and 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 uh and uh, Smoky Mountain. Uh, 
and Cornette is work, working back and forth with WWE at that time, and yeah. and, and he he he, he kind of closes down, or he did close down Smoky Mountain. And you guys' next move, of course, is to WWE, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we went up there. That's when they were doing that part-time contract. Wow. Um, you wanted to which, have more competitive. T.L. Hopper was on. That's what, you know. <laughs> T.L. Hopper was on, and uh, what, what, was what, what, what characters we had back in there? I mean, it was a. It was almost like flavor of the week. <laughs> <laughs> you know who was getting over it? That was uh, Bill Irwin as the goon. As, as the, the goon, goon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was getting over. Those boots were crazy. Remember those boots? They were all skinny down the bottom, and yeah, it looked like I ice don't know how he wore them. Yeah, without he, blowing an ankle. No, I don't yeah. know how. When he yeah. wrestled in Texas, he wrestled in, in regular cowboy boots, just cowboy boots you got off the shelf. I mean, it, yeah. it was it was. Okay, all right, Marsh. I got, I got, I got, I got to get this off my, my chest now. You, you owe me all the time about giving you, uh, saying, they're telling everybody you look like uh, Beaver Cleaver. When, <laughs> when, when you had that hair and you were young and everything, you did look just like Beaver Cleaver. <laughs> but, but that, that's that don't that not even it close to what happened to you. You were a good, good friend, brother, love when he put you guys in dresses and sisters of love. Now, come yeah. on. I, and uh, fortunately, that didn't right last there. long. Somebody ago. actually made us action figure yeah. those are right up there on the shelf. <laughs> but it was weird. So so we got, uh, I guess, told by the by the higher ups and stuff like that. Vince called us and he was like, I got this great idea. He goes, I want you guys to come up to New York. We'll go outfit you and stuff like that. And then they showed us a picture of Sally Fields when she did the Flying Nun Flying TV up. show and stuff like that, we're like, "What?" We're like this <laughs> has nothing to. We're like, "This has nothing to do with the headbanger gimmick." Like, like, no, no, that's no, got to no. be a mistake. And they're like, yeah. "No, just go to. They're going to fit you for new outfits." We're like, "When Vince like calls you and tells you you got something, you drop them." Uh, that's it. <laughs> yeah. So we went up there, and he said, "Oh, what we're going to do is we're going to make you guys insane, crazy. You guys don't care what you wear, the skirts, the dresses, the the nun outfits. We're just going to." you guys are just going to want to fight. So that's when they came up with the shotgun Saturday night too. We were in the very first match of the very first ever shotgun Saturday night at the bar. And those um, things were zoos too. Wow. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. So, there was so much fun. We had so much fun. And we those were great shows. Yeah, oh, there, was there, was no, there, there was no control over anything. No, no. No. I'll never forget. We were upstairs in, I, I guess, a, a dressing room and Vince was there and he was like, we had brows on and stuff like that. And we had, you know, we stuffed them and he was like, oh no, he took a tablecloth off the table and started shoving them in, in the, the, the brows. And he goes, because your tits need to be and bigger. Like out like this. <laughs> it was huge. So yeah, we, I mean, hell, we had fun. It, you know, we, uh, we didn't see where it went. At, at that point it was, you know, you know, we're just happy to be there. Whatever you want us to do, we're going to do. We'll do but the funny part was about the nun thing for me is, I grew up Catholic. I was an altar boy. Um, so they have us at St. Patrick's. I think it's St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. It's a real big one. And they're like, just stand up there, act like you're praying. And when you walk down, you know, we're going to film you getting a limo and leave. And I'm like, okay. They had it timed so well. The doors opened and all the people came out. And I was like, oh, shit. Because Glenn's got, you know, he's got the, the nose gimmick in, the chain. The, we have the earrings and, you know, we have the, the, the facial hair. And as we're looking down, the people, the ladies started bowing to us. They started like kneeling and they look up and they see our faces and they're like, is this a joke? This isn't funny. You're going to burn in hell. And I'm like, wow, holy shit. I'm like, what, the <laughs> I'm like, what are we doing? <laughs> so, and then we walk down, we get in the limo and I was just like, oh my God. And then I'm going to burn in hell. Like, <laughs> and I said, I go, what the fuck is this? Like, what just happened? And the, 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 the divider, the privacy glass came down and Vince turns around. He goes, we just made money. That's what we did. He goes, boys, that was awesome. I was like, oh, we're like, oh, sure. Yeah, okay. whatever you need. What do you want us to do now? That's the one again. <laughs> Who was producing it, Bruce? Um, no, Bruce. I don't think I don't Bruce, was, Bruce there. was there or not. Because, yeah, because Bruce wasn't with us when we did it. So I don't probably remember. Vince, if Vince was, probably Vince produced it. Because Vince yeah, used to produce remember. those old ones. Like so that. He, you guys are filming in St. Patrick's Cathedral. You guys didn't have permission, did you? No. no. <laughs> I knew it. No, I knew it. We didn't. And then when the when the nuns got arrested, we were in the Disney store on uh, in downtown New York City. Times Square. We were staring in the window like this. 
And the police were like, they had to like the gimmick cops come up to us. And like, what are you doing? We're like, oh, we're just watching the kids in the store. <laughs> just, uh, they had us arrested for, for staring at the kids. <laughs> and then they were never to be seen again. Never so you again. guys went into St. Patrick's Cathedral dressed up as nuns. No one is in on it. And they no got time. a worship service going. And people well, we didn't actually part of we didn't we didn't actually go inside. We stood at the very top of the steps right by the doors. So we were still outside. So when the doors opened, they just had it timed perfectly to when service ended, everyone came out. So they had all the people around us. They had people dropping to their knees in front of us. It was, just, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, was it was funny. Got hit by a purse. Get out! So my hitch over there with a cross. Yeah, I, I don't know if me and Jerry are going to go to hell, but we're going to be above you if we are. Yeah. <laughs> you guys, you guys are going to be the bottom. Like way in the bottom. Yeah, it's hot down there. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the scene in the movie Highlander. If you remember the movie where the the guys in the in the in the, in the church, Happy Halloween, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're definitely. Were you guys um, mic'd up or anything, or just? Uh, no. no, no, no. It was just all visual. It was just thing. it was all video. Yeah, I think when they showed it on on TV, it was just kind of because they showed it on Shotgun Saturday Night before we came out. It was all you know. They it was B roll, so they just talked over it. So you guys were on the very first one. That's the only one that I missed. That was in New York City at one of those really nightclubs. Hot, 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 night nightclubs night up there, yeah. Yeah. Well, I did. It was great because we still lived in South Jersey. So we had, we drove up for every single one of them when they did it in New York. I mean, I remember the one at the train station. Yeah. That was it. You know, Hunter and Undertaker when uh, they were going up the escalator. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, those shows were, were classic. I mean, they're, they're, and too, you know, there was no control, but they were, they're pretty well structured and we were, we're always able to get, to get our stories in that thing. But, it was just pure chaos, both outside on the one side of the camera and on the other side of the camera. It was just pure chaos the whole night. You just well, you, you didn't know how the crowd was going to react ever either. Right. No. Right. Well, no, that, and that's before time. and that's well, before Jerry, like, see, we got how you're sending fake nuns into a real church. <laughs> of course you don't know how they're gonna react. <laughs> and so the one time we go and not only fake shotgun. nuns. Dudes with tattoos and piercings. Yeah. And, 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 and it's not facial hair. Women. Yeah, it's not fake women playing fake nuns. It's men playing fake hey, nuns. Yeah, yeah. Made it even worse. <laughs> So you, so you have, have your run there. And so Bruce was just with you that one night, basically, right? And then yeah, because then we did up. it the one we did and it. That he one was night. off. He was off for another one of his breaks. <laughs> and then uh, yeah, because we were supposed to go the next, the following week. It was in um, like Corpus Christi, I think it was in yeah. Texas. Yeah. And they had us fly in. They flew us in. They had us bring all the gear, and they were like, "Yeah, we can't do that here. Like we're gonna we'll get shot, burnt down. Like this is too religious of an area." But you go to so, St. Patrick's, but you can't go to San Antonio. <laughs> no, you can't, no. You can't go to people down there have guns. Everybody yeah. has guns. <laughs> Real guns. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we got chased one time at Smoky Mountain with guns. I didn't need to have, to have that happen yeah. again. Um, but yeah, so they and then the following week is when they had us arrested, staring in the Disney store. <laughs> and then that night they had us arrested. They had us arrested, and they announced that the head the uh, the flying nuns were arrested. But then that night, we were on shotgun Saturday night as the headbangers. So it was like the strangest thing ever. <laughs> Tremendous. <laughs> so what, what happened with the time with you guys? With because I was there and I didn't hear the backstage story. I saw the aftermath with the uh, insane clown posse. So we were we were told up front that they were bringing them in. And we we're going to form our own. That's when they had all the groups going on and they were going to put us together as a faction. And we were going to feud with um, DX with um, Glenn and I going against Billy and road dog, like form our own thing. So that's when the first we were starting with the oddities. Um, so basically it got over the story we got was it got over so well, the clowns the next day went into Vince's office and did the old, so that went really well. And Vince was like, yeah, they're like, but what went better than we thought? And Vince was like, yeah, no, got a good, really good reaction. They're like, we want more money. <laughs> and Vince went, okay, let me think about it. So from that point forward, it kind of got squashed. And then we were told that uh, that's when we did the chairs and we beat the shit out of them with the chairs. We were told it needed to be laid in. It needed to be hard. 
or um, you know, maybe we wouldn't be back the next day either. It was kind of the insinuation that we got. So we did what we were told to do. And um, yeah, that, that was basically it. And the funny part is, is they called us years later. This was probably, I don't know, five or six years ago. They yeah. called us to do the gathering. And I was the like, juggalos. oh shit. The, they do that the gathering of the juggalos every year. And I was like, oh shit. And I'm like, <laughs> is this kind of their way that they want to pay us you know, we're going to get payback on us. So I threw feet. out, <laughs> I threw out an astronomical number for them to book us and they agreed to pay it. And I went, Oh no, 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 no. Now you know for sure there's going to be a hundred juggalos <laughs> waiting, <laughs> waiting for us yeah. at the airport. Like we're not even going to get out of the airport. Um, but no, we, we showed up, we got there and uh, they came running over to us and the way they were running we're like oh here we go <laughs> like they're charging us so we're like standing up like all right we might have to defend ourselves and it was like big hugs and they were like you guys beat the shit out of us like, like that was so much fun we loved it it was so awesome we're like oh we did like did we really beat you up that <laughs> i don't remember <laughs> i mean because those guys are really over it and i don't mean to make this sound insulting in their world like yeah. we're all, you know we're, we're all in our own world we're in our yeah. world here but in their world they're really yeah. over right? Big time. Big were they time. were they nice guys to deal with? Because I I only got to, I shook their hand. That was all. I met them, but I don't nothing more. Yeah, I mean they seemed they were they, they were huge fans. Um, so they were into it. Um, I think it really could have went really well, and it could have went far. Um, if they just if they would have kept their egos in check, it was the egos when they went in the next day demanding more money. Um, it got you it think, got you think it was them, or do you think it was uh, who they were associated with? Uh, lead pulling the strings on. Um, I don't know. Like their so, management team, it could have been their management team. Well, I, I'm not even talking about their management team. I'm talking about the 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 the, the wrestling manager that they were under at that time. With ECW, Maybe. ECW people. Yeah, yeah I, I don't. No idea. I don't know. No, I that, that's, how, that's how I always considered it. Uh, they, they were getting some wrong advice because that they they would they would get they would come in and if I remember they had their own touring bus outside, the, yep. outside which yep. got a lot of heat yep. also on them. You know? so yeah, they they stayed outside the locker room because they didn't want to get thrown out of the dressing room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I remember that too. Yeah, but it's like John said, like they were over in their world. They were in their huge. world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, so, you know, in our world, they weren't so over, but they got the reaction. You know, we got a, when we turned and we cut Luna's hair, I mean, the reaction we got was, was ridiculous. Yeah, my, my point um, more than that, they were always, personally, they were always, seemed like they were good guys, you know, and, and yes. got along, but it just seemed like business-wise, they, they didn't know our world and we didn't know their world. It right. seemed like they were getting wrong advice to, to, to be in our world there. Right. Yes. Yeah, because that's a good point, Jerry, because you don't know. You go in somebody else's world, you know, and, and they'll tell you this is what this is how you handle business. If you trust that person, that's how you handle business. Right. right. And yeah. how you handle business. If, the, if they give you wrong advice, you just screwed up and you didn't mean to. So I, I, I yeah, you screw up. You screw up without even knowing. It's yeah, like guilty exactly. by association. Yeah. Yeah, because they seem when I met them short briefly, they seem like good guys. Yeah, no, they were. And then when we went back to the gathering. They were great. After we went that. back a couple times after that. Yeah. Are you still and waiting then... for the hook at any point near the gathering? Like, okay, <laughs> the whole all right. Entire it's time. The whole entire it's time. 10 o'clock. They're going to get me at some point. Yeah. yeah. The whole and then, entire time you're looking over your shoulder. And then <laughs> the they, they, you know, they have their own wrestling thing, the Juggalo Wrestling Federation or whatever it is. And um, they were starting to do shows. They were flying us all over to do shows for them and everything. So, I mean, yeah, at some point we were like, something's going to, I'm going to get shanked or something. Shaft, something's going to happen. <laughs> But um, no, they were great guys. Like they were happy to have us on all the shows. We were happy to do them because they paid well. Um, so and no, you guys, you guys fit in. There. You guys were able to fit into that world pretty well too because of, of your characters. Yeah, yeah, because of the, the gimmick. Yeah. All yeah. thanks to Jim Cornette uh, having you guys beat Marilyn Manson, who he didn't know who Marilyn Manson was. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Was. Exactly. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I, I wonder if he realizes Marilyn Manson, who Marilyn Manson is now. You know, that, that's that guy I saw that I gave the headbangers a name. <laughs> <laughs> so the Beaver Cleavage character, which I loved, by the way, I, I did too. That, that had to come from Bruce Pritchard because Bruce Pritchard is a huge Beaver, Leave It to Beaver fan. 
You That's know what? It, it, it's funny because Bruce is the one who called me and said, this is when Glenn was hurt. I, I, I goes, don't know for sure. I just, I'm willing to bet anything it was Bruce because Bruce, we were in, I don't know where we were, Universal Studios blame it on Bruce. I'm, I'm for that. Yeah. He got all excited about <laughs> the little kid when he, when he saw Leave it to Beaver's house, you know, the, the studio <laughs> set. Right. Um, yeah, I was excited to do it because, you know, I had – three matches by myself and then everything else was was with glenn and tagging glenn was hurt now glenn was ex- just got glenn just got what your shoulder hurt or something like that. his knee my knee, my your knee. knee hurt and yeah. yeah you had to take some time off and yeah. yeah so i was excited i'm like here's an opportunity for me to do something on my own which i've never done um you know and still stay on the road and have a good time and then after we did the first those first four sets of vignettes i'm like this is going to be amazing. My head's going to be buried in titties every night. I mean, like, how bad <laughs> How bad could this be? This is going to be awesome. And it was like a goofy gimmick where I just acted like a big kid. And it was it was fun doing, I mean, obviously the vignettes were fun. Then I had the one match um, with Christian and then it got squashed after that. And uh, from there, I kind of went, I'm a, I'm a kid from Jersey now. I'm Chaz. Like, but I was like, who the fuck is Chaz? I, I had no idea who Chaz was. So, um, no, I thought it would have went, I think it would have gotten over big time and uh, just would have been a blast doing it. I think everyone would have had fun with it. Yeah, and, and who was that? It was Mary Ann was, what was the, the who played Mariana this? was her name, yeah. 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 She, passed she passed away a few, just a few years after that, right? Yeah, she passed away a few years ago. She had um, breast cancer and passed yeah. away. Yeah. Yeah, I just when I was when I saw that the first time when I when I was looking at stuff today to get ready for you guys coming on, I was I think that, that's Bruce Pritchard. There's no <laughs> there's no other person on the planet except for Bruce Pritchard that would come up with that. <laughs> and the lines were awesome. I mean, the, the, those the, the the vignettes we did, you know, with when she's slicing the zucchini, and I'm like, Mom, the cat's stuck under the bed, and she goes pussy's under the bed and the pussy won't come out and i'm like no <laughs> pussy won't, won't come out and she holds up the zucchini she goes don't worry mama knows how to get pussy out <laughs> like you're out to make pussy happy or something like that it's like, i mean just the, the 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 you know the innuendos were awesome <laughs> the insinuating of having sex with your mother and i was like they're like do you mind and i'm like no nah, i don't care <laughs> like, let's do it <laughs> The Jerry, Jerry will tell you, and you guys know, Bruce is one of those guys, he's so free, he's so creative, that when you talk to him about something serious, you know, like if you talk to him, somebody will get WrestleMania coming up, but if you bring up Beaver cleavage, that's when he goes crazy. He goes, yes, <laughs> and we'll have a zucchini, and then we'll have a cat. <laughs> we'll, have, we'll, have, we'll have milk, we'll have, we'll have a, a skinned knee, and we're going to say, when it comes to working on your knees, my mama knows best. Like, <laughs> Yes. So that time in, in that era, I mean, you guys got to go through the entire Attitude Era. I mean, that's, you know, which we're lucky because of that. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. when, when, we are. When, yeah. when you, you know, when you go to conventions or stuff, people are, that was when all the ratings were so high. Yeah. You know, thanks to, you know, Rock and Stone Cold and Undertaker, a bunch of guys, but we had a quick. And, and Gerald Briscoe. And, that's and, right. That's and, right. The hardcore who also wore dresses, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> one very highly rated segment. <laughs> but it's so, it's so cool that we were part of that because that's what everybody will remember. You know, we could live to be a hundred, which I hope we all do. Jerry's a past. Uh, I'm there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <Jerry's 104. laughs> but it's so cool to have been a part of that whole era that, uh, you know, cause you guys came in when business first started getting decent, right? In 96 or was business still bad? We got it, there it, it, just, we got there right as um, Scott and Kevin left. I mean, I think that whole, click thing at the madison square garden probably happened a month before we came yeah. um so it was yeah it was 96 we signed our that part-time deal in november of 96 so it was literally right after that right after they left that's when um they were doing the fake cane or the fake diesel and uh so all of that stuff so yeah we came in right at the beginning of that that was a hard time it really was a hard time Ooh. because there's a big transition going on and we had very few people that were over. We had a lot of guys that could get over and did get over, but it was it was a rough transition there for for the company and for the talent on top of it because they, you know, you guys were working your butts off and not making a whole hell of a lot of money and and being tempted by by the printing press down south there as they say there. So, but 
but we we did it. We 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 hung it. Everybody, all the talent hung in there and got their talents over, and, and soon we're we're busting at the same. Because you think about it, Jerry, during that time when they came in, we had the we had the best roster maybe of all time. You know, before Kevin and Scott left, we had the NWO with us. We yeah. had the hottest guy maybe in wrestling history, but he was the ringmaster. Right. We had yeah. Fake Diesel, <laughs> who ended up yeah. becoming this twenty-year run of main events Hall of Famer. You know, we had we had Rockabilly, who ended up becoming part of the New Age Outlaws, along with we had Brody. Isaac Isaac Yankum, yeah, who Brody. became a Hall of Famer. Too. That's right. We had we had we had all the right guys. Yeah. We just had guys that were in crazy characters that yeah. had that figured out what they go. Almost everybody funny. goes through that. I mean, you and guys funny. Through spiders. You guys, you, you go through character phases until you find something that works. And yeah. it's funny you, you say that because I watched the the A E biography on DX, and it goes back to you know the click the videos of them at, at Madison Square Garden after the match and all that stuff. And it, some of that stuff you kind of knew about, but you didn't really know about. And then to hear like you know they went through the history, like you said, of Rockabilly and and Road Dog, you know, being Jeff Jarrett's, um, you know, Road Dog. Um, and the different characters and how they all developed into something else and the progression of it. Um, so, yeah, so it was, was kind of cool. Yeah, and there that time you had uh, one of the greatest uh, tag team eras. You know, I think probably around 90 in WCW when you had the Road Warriors and Ricky and Robert and the Skyscrapers and, you know, you w- was another, obviously, along with the Steiners, that was a huge era. But th- that was one of the greatest eras of tag team which you talk about Larry Sharp giving you advice, which is true. You know, it is hard to get booked as a tag team, except for that time, you know, because you had right. some of the greatest tag team matches of all time, including the tables, ladders, and chairs match, which thankfully none of us were involved in. Did you guys ever have a table, ladder, and chair match? Yeah, we actually just did one probably, I don't know, a year ago. Just with, did um, one. You guys are you guys are senior citizens now. <laughs> probably like we did it with hey, um we hey. did it with we, we did it with the Ascension. Uh, yeah. We did wow. it with we we did it with them up in um wow. how, 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 how were the ladders, guys? <laughs> they were they were three foot three foot steps stools. They were fine. Just enough to reach the top shelf at, yeah. at Costco. <laughs> So yeah, we we did that. It was probably like two years ago we did that. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And they're still walking. Still walking. <laughs> so the, the all the guys that did it, man, you got to throw out props to them. Oh, wow. What what the uh, risks are putting their body and you can, you know, there you can't rehearse a fall. I mean, you just <laughs> no. well, you're going to get up there and I'm going to knock this ladder out and your ladder is going to tip on the rope, that, but you don't go off. It tips back up and shoots back up as it shoots back up at the higher plateau. You take a bump into this table and this table is going to go down to the exploding. I mean, uh, explosive. At, least, at, least, at least we hope that's how it works. Yeah, at least <laughs> I mean, we hope. <laughs> you guys all know. I mean, you put a, 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 a large amount of trust in the people that you're working with that, that you know, you're going to be safe. And, yeah. you know, we felt that way because, you know, we two years ago, we were both older. <laughs> and uh, so, it, it, you know, when we got to the match and stuff like that with them, it was just like, you know, I trusted them. And, you know, I knew that we weren't going to be putting ourselves in any danger that they wouldn't be able to handle for us. So it, it worked out really good. I thought it was a good match and, it, you know, it wasn't iconic, <laughs> but you know, it was decent for what it was worth. You know, and that was the thing about the, during that time then, you know, the, when, when we came through, you know, the 90s and some of these matches were first coming into what everybody does now, they were new. And so you didn't know what was safe. You didn't know what worked. Right. You know, yeah, you no. didn't have the safety protocols that they have now. You know, it just right. kind of, okay, we're going to get on a ladder. And we're both going to jump off. And we hope, we think we're going to be okay. Right. <laughs> right. Hey, it was just like wrestling on you when you came at you with the clothesline like that and everything <laughs> else. But it was so funny because, I mean, we worked you and, and Ron and stuff like that, you know, a couple of times and stuff like that. And I wrestled with you before even, you know, the APA existed. And you know what? It, it, was it a tight clothesline? Sure it was. But you just had to know it's how to snug. do it. It's snug. <laughs> it's snug. It's just snug. I'm just glad. Now, what, 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 just glad. what was worse, falling off a 15-foot ladder or taking JBL's uh, clothesline from hell? Oh, the clothesline I, I'm, from I'm, hell. I've heard the clothesline <laughs> from hell. Stop uh, it. Many, many times. <laughs> I'm just glad at WrestleMania 13 when we had when um, you and Barry were in that we all did that four-way match. Like you I just kind of 
Yeah, you kind of went off with with Henry for a little bit. We're like, all right, we'll let the two of them beat each other up. For a <laughs> <bit."> <laughs> I think Jerry brought the spot to us. They wanted to see me and Henry hit each other with a clothesline, a double yeah. clothesline. No, <laughs> oh my god! You know, Henry bench pressed like four thousand pounds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, you want to talk about just being country strong? Oh, right there. He was so <laughs> big, and, and he asked me right before we went out because you know we're really we were really close friends, like all of us were. And he goes. Okay, what are you going to do? He wanted to make sure I did wasn't going to double cross him at Mania or wherever <laughs> it was. I said, I'm just going to hit you as hard as I can, and I'm going to throw my feet straight up. And he goes, okay, I am too. We hit each other. <laughs> as soon as we landed, I rolled over, and I said, if anybody ever calls that again, ignore it. Just do <laughs> This is the one only. <laughs> Yeah, we used to do those country. That was all matches. thanks to Gerald Briscoe. <laughs> it's all Briscoe's fault. Yeah. We used to do those um, country whipping matches with them, and I mean, when Henry hit you, I was like, I was like, I grabbed Phineas. I'm like, Tex, come on, let's go over here. We're gonna get away. <laughs> right. I want to get away from Henry. I like Glenn over there. Glenn likes all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, and, and and those those whips too. They were like four inches wide, and they were they were thick. They were tough. They were. They were hard. And we even did them on the house shows. It wasn't just like a oh, yeah. We did them on house shows. And which was great because we had t-shirts on and you know they didn't. <laughs> well, eventually, eventually they started coming out with t-shirts underneath yeah. the overalls. <laughs> oh, I had them with Savio and Savio had that big jersey on. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. He's what yeah. people really like when they hear the crack. I go, dude, I'm half naked. Right. <laughs> no cracking. No. You're wearing a jersey. Yeah. <laughs> when, yeah. when you guys when you guys were working with the Godwins, that had to be a lot of fun because they're two tremendous athletes and, and two guys that you could completely trust in the ring and two 100%. guys that could move could move as well as you guys could. So that that chemistry was really good there. We're we're asked all the time our favorites. Um, they're my number one. They're my favorite, and then Billy and Road Dog would be number two. Yeah. Because just just the not just the the matches. Um, I actually just told this story last night was when um, we did the show, we, we were in Canada, we went from Montreal to Ottawa, and that's when Doug and Phil, I think Scorp was in the car, they all flipped their car, um, they all were late getting there, and Jack told us, Lanja, he goes to the four of us, he goes, I don't know how long I'm going to need you guys to go, your opening match, just go out there until I walk down, once I walk through the curtain, then you can go home. It was 45 minutes we were out there, and it's probably one of the best matches we ever had because we legit, we were able, it was old school. We were able to tell us, I don't think we locked up for 15 minutes. And when we did, the place finally popped, and we, like, locked up and, like, grabbed an arm, and they popped for it. Um, they were just so easy to work. <laughs> tell, tell, tell us a little bit about that tag team. Well, that's a forgotten tag team, Phil. Uh, uh, Phil, uh, Phil and Lafon Doug and Phil. And, and Doug and Doug. Uh, they, they were tremendous athlete but tell us a little bit about about working with those guys they were i mean to say they were snug <laughs> would, would put it lightly the, the I problem mean, i the problem Japan snug yeah Japan so the snug. problem i think over here and with the with the fans they didn't get over with the fans in the u.s because there was no gimmick there was no personality and back then like john said everyone was a character there was gimmicks everyone had a gimmick and a personality they just didn't have it but they were good to work. They were solid. They were, they were easy. They were fun. They just, there was no personality to come out in them. And as much as Glenn and I are goofballs in the ring and we try to joke around and get something out, they just wouldn't put anything over. Like Phineas and I, he would, he would spit in the air, catch it and rub it in his hair. The fans would boo. I'd spit in the air and catch it in my mouth and they would cheer. Like it doesn't make any sense. But for them, if I did that to them, they would just stare at me and go, why did you do that? And I'm like, the reaction from the cr I don't know. Like, what do you mean? Why am I doing that? You know, so, Furnace, that's was, how it was. Uh, Furnace was at least a national level power lifter, maybe a world yeah. class power yeah. lifter. World, world class, I believe. World class yeah. power lifter. He was. And, and they were huge in Japan. I mean, yeah. they, yeah. they yeah. got yeah. over yeah. in Japan. Because Mega, Mega star, yeah. That's Doug the, was that's... the reason. Doug was the reason I started wearing ankle braces under my boots because he gave me that quick, short snap suplex. And I was expecting to jump and go over. And I hit, and I just, my ankle just rolled right underneath, and I was like, "Oh, so that's how you're doing that?" Like it was not something, and it wasn't me jumping. He literally snatched me and just was like, Phew, "Let's go!" And I went so fast, uh, went, and went so hard. Yeah, I was like, Barry oh, Wendell used to tell him, "Goes, he goes, do a leapfrog," and he goes, "And I'm not ducking one bit." And that freaking <laughs> furnace could Wait, jump that he high. Get right up there, yeah. He yeah, was yeah. an unbelievable athlete. So was Lafon, but furnace yeah. was man. He was just he was a world class strength as well. It, it was amazing. Those guys were a good tag team. Yeah, they just never. 
like you say, everybody at that time had a some type of character, and their character was they were just really good wrestlers. Yeah, yeah. they were from yep. Japan. They were good wrestlers, and there was no there was no personality. Nothing. They if, were bland. If, if you would take them today and put them in today's wrestling, oh. they'd be they'd be over a million bucks. They'd That's be right. Over they'd be a million over like bucks. crazy. Yeah. You know what else 100%. is a shame? Is a shame that uh, Henry Godwin uh, got. I don't know. I don't want to be unfair historically. You know, you go back, not trying to change history, got talked into that road warrior spot where he the, broke his neck. The you know, because that guy could have been, he was so good. And yeah. so was Phineas. Yeah. They could have been around a long time if Henry hadn't got hurt. They were just so easy to work with. You know, and it was so funny that back at that time, me and Chaz, we were just in awe. You know, you had the, the, the Blackjacks, you had, you know, Doug and Phil, Owen and, and Davey Boy, the, the Road Warriors, Billy and Jesse. You know, you had all these guys, and then here we are. And we're just, like, amazed that we were even, you know, included in that during that time. So, you know, it was it was something that, you know, I'm forever grateful for, and, and I'll never forget it. So, so. And also during that time, the house shows, like, they call them so live fun. events now, were just, were just amazing. <laughs> so much fun i mean they were fun and i mean they were just they were awesome from top to bottom they were they, they may be now i don't know i haven't been to one in years yeah. but they were so much fun back then they, to go to those live events and because the matches were just amazing with all these great workers yeah yeah no it was all fun it was it was so much fun and like glenn said so grateful that we got to the opportunity and for me personally to get because everything from when I walked into the school to three weeks in being on, you know, WWF TV to Glenn and I tagging to going to Memphis to go like everything just progressed. And it just was kind of meant to be and to be around those guys and then be in the ring with guys. I watch like we're, I'm in the ring with Brett and Anvil and Davey boy and, and bulldog. And it was just a whole career has just been amazing. Tell, tell us a little bit about what, what you guys are up to now. What, what, where's your career taking you? And, and uh, I know you, you're still, as you see my son out there, Wes, a lot on, on the road there. So, uh, so tell me a little bit about where, where people can find and what you guys are up to now. Well, I, I mean, it's funny. It, it's, it's our, revol- our roles have reversed. Um, yeah. You know, I moved down to Florida about 10 years ago, and, you know, I was really, really bad overweight. I've had, you know, fights with weight problems probably since I left WWF. I was as heavy as 315 at one time. And I came down here and Chaz was like, just move down to Florida. We'll get back together. We'll start wrestling again and everything else. It, all, it only took him 10 years to do that, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. he was telling me for 10 years to come down here and everything else. I was just like, nah, nah, nah. So I finally moved down here and everything else. And I got as low as like 215. Wow. And um, it was, it was, it was bad. And, um, what do you think your weight problem uh, uh, was caused by? Just uh, just yeah. not being active and just depression you know, or stuff? You know what it was, Jerry, and I'm going to be honest. It was a lot of it was depression. Uh, I left when I left WWE at the time and stuff like that. I didn't know what to do. I had no idea what to do. Um, Chaz was down here, you know, still doing his own thing. I, I just, I, I didn't know what to do. So, you know, I was just eating everything and anything. And then I got involved in, you know, I had to find a job. I had to find something to do. So I got involved with, with pizza and uh, Papa John's and stuff. So I was eating more now. I was selling, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it was a lot. I want to say it was, it was a great deal of depression because, you know, you're, you're here one minute and then the next minute you're, you're totally gone. And, and, and that's a hell of a deal with uh, mentally. It, you just really. don't know what to do. And, and it, it was you know, wrestling was a, a big part of my life. It still is to this day. And um, it was just weird how, you know, everything came to be. And then when I did, did move down here, I lost all that weight. And then we're wrestling, you know, constantly and everything else. I'm working in the gym, you know, I, I'm losing all the weight and everything else. And everything was falling into place. And you know, we were doing so much more. We were doing every, every weekend we were busy. And then, um, you know, we get a, a call to go back in 2016 and, and Chad's got the call from road dog and he thought it was a rib <laughs> at first. Good. So go ahead. Oh no, I just, I got a text and it was, I, you know, I had Brian's number and it said, Hey, hey can you guys do SmackDown on Tuesday night? And I was like, huh. yeah, who is this? Because my <laughs> thing was, is doing, you know, I have my, my son's 18 now. He just left for college. Um, and my whole thing was he seen me do 
thousands of indie shows to the point where Glenn and I are in the ring and I look over and there's Tyler sound asleep on the gimmick table. I'm like, are we that boring that you're sleeping during our match? Um, so, you know, I would reach out to Hunter now and then, and then when I would see Brian on shows, I'd be like, you know, I just want to do one match, just one match in a, in a WWE ring. I just want him to see me one time in that. So when they would come down here and, um, you know, do the arenas down here in South Florida, I always asked, and I was always told no. So when Brian sent me the text and then I just immediately called him, I'm like, are you kidding me? He's like, no. He's like, yeah, we have this storyline going on. We'd like to have you guys back. And I'm like, fuck yeah, of course. Um, it ended up falling through because it was supposed to be, what's it, Foxwoods, whatever the casino is up in Fox, Connecticut. Yeah. Yeah. And they needed to have full blood work done. And we would have never gotten the blood work done in time. So Brian said to me, he goes, you know, we're going to try to hold off the storyline for another week, and then we'll see if we can get you guys in Dallas. So I'm like, all right. So I watched SmackDown. And I'm like, where's the storyline? Let me see where we're fitting in. And I see no storyline. And I was like, all right, so I don't know. So we wait. Now it's Tuesday, it's Wednesday, it's Thursday, it's Friday. Don't hear from them. Glenn and I are texting like, do you hear something? <laughs> haven't heard anything. Do you hear something? Haven't heard anything. And then it was like 6 o'clock on Friday night, I get the phone call from Howard Finkel <laughs> saying, hey, we need you guys in Dallas. Um, you know, we need you guys in Dallas on Tuesday for SmackDown. So, you know, where are you flying from? What, you know, give me all the info. And so and there it was. And for me to go back after all those years was the greatest. And my wife at the time actually took her – phone and put it on the floor behind Tyler watching me come out live on TV so to get to see his reaction um, come out as I came out was to me it's probably one of the greatest things uh, ever and it was funny I said to him because I used to do the monkey face all the time I said what do you want me to do for you as I come out so you know it's just for you you want me to do the monkey face he goes no he goes you always did that for Amy who's my niece and I said all right what do you want he goes I want you to dad and I go, that's when Cam Newton was big with the dab. And I go, I hate the dab. I'm not doing it. He goes, that's why I want you to do the dab. So I was like, all right. So I just lucked out. And I didn't even tell, you know, we usually pitch camera guys about something, you know, to catch. You want them to catch. I didn't say anything to anybody. And when I rolled in and I hit the corner and I dab, his reaction in the video of seeing that is probably one of the greatest, like, moments for me because yeah. right then and there it just was like i'm like all right this like i could be done minus never being in japan last thing on my bucket list um i said <laughs> like i could be done him seeing me there and being able to watch actually watch him as i come down in the ring and do it was um awesome yeah it was just amazing yeah. it was amazing. And, and, and then for me going back and it was more like a, a full circle for me you know i was at you know probably the, the lowest of lows after i left and then to actually come back and, and the, the welcome that we got from the locker room, you know, the first guy that came up to us was Cena when we went into the catering and stuff like that. And he was like, guys, welcome back. So glad you guys are home. Blah, blah. You know, just, just the reception that we got and everything else. And for me personally, to know that the struggles that I went through with the weight gain and stuff like that and everything else, and to actually be back there. And then my two oldest kids were babies when we were, wrestling and stuff like that and they always used to come whenever we wrestled in philly and they would always hang out with either sean or steve austin because steve looked like me from the back that's what i was told so um you know the the one of the following weeks after that we were actually up in newark and they actually were in the live audience at that time so they got to see why you know back then they didn't really understand why daddy got pulled away all the time now they got the chance to see it live and stuff like that they were older and, you know, it was just, it, it's hard to put words behind, like, the emotions that, that I felt. And it was just, you know, I was grateful is what, is what it comes awesome down to. Awesome story. Yeah, it's fantastic yeah. story. And, and you guys both know, being on, like, I was fortunate to where, you know, Glenn was married. Um, when, when I first met Glenn, Paige's oldest was two months old. Um, so I got to watch all of them grow up. Morgan, his second, is my goddaughter. So, but I was fortunate where I wasn't married. I didn't have any kids. I had zero responsibility the entire time we were on the road all those years. Um, so I didn't realize things were being missed. I, I tell this story all the time. I'm sitting there with, with Billy in the locker room. We're in Montreal. And I was like, dude, what's wrong with you? And he's like, I think it was Colton. He's like, Colton hit his first home run tonight. And I'm sitting here in freaking, you know, Montreal, Canada. And I was like, you know, it's Montreal. And I'm like, 
but we're still going out though, right? Like to me, it meant <laughs> nothing. It meant nothing. And then, um, you know, years later, I have a son and he played travel soccer and I was actually off for a work trip. And it was Glenn who took Tyler to his soccer game. And I get this text about the amazing goal that Tyler scored. He out like four people and he kisses right. it and it bends the ball. And I was like, and I missed it. Like, I didn't realize how much everyone missed, right. you know, growing, you know, but I could, I don't know if I could have done that like Glenn did all those years. And like all of you did, you know, with, with having kids and stuff like that. I don't know if I could have done it back then having all that and knowing I was, you know, missing everything, even though, yeah. you know, you're on the road for a job and taking care of your family and stuff. It just makes you appreciate it even more. You guys got to have a fantastic friendship because here, here's a guy, your guys are on the road. And we all know how the road is. Even, even the people listening out there, you got one guy married and one guy single and you guys, people out, out there in, in, the, in the internet world, they don't realize the time that you guys spend together and how you guys got to work together. One being married and, and having a family, the other guy being single. And it's rough. And you, you got to have a great friendship to, to get by with that and you guys certainly have it always great to see you guys together when i do get to see you at one of these shows uh, you guys always put a smile on my face we have such great memories together uh, and I, i'm really proud uh, of you guys and what what you guys have become out, out out here in the independent scene because you're you're sharing your knowledge you're sharing your experience with a lot of these kids that don't know what that road life is going to be like and you guys always will have that there so Man, congratulations. Thanks so much for being on the show. No, thank yeah. you. This was this, this was awesome. It was great to laugh and, and reminisce and uh, just shoot the shit and talk. Yeah, so absolutely. it's just good. <laughs> yeah, you know, I had a great, a great relationship like that with Ron, and it, it's cool to hear that from you guys because tag teams go one way or the other usually. You know, usually yeah. after a long time together, they're either really close like you guys are, me and Ron are, or they get, you know, they get separate, you know, they just, they don't really like each other. It's cool when it ends up the right way or the cool it, way, you know, so. It, it's so uh, funny. He's actually like 10 minutes down the street from me right now. <laughs> yeah, we, we live literally 10 yeah. minutes away from one another. We actually just did a, a, a poker tournament, a charity poker tournament together on Sunday, this past Sunday. Um, for 9-11. So, yeah, for 9-11, yeah. for irreverent warriors. Um, so, yeah, so that's. For me, a fortunate thing with what I'm doing now, I get to do my company's philanthropic. So I'm able to get back and do all these, this extra stuff and talk about stuff like this, where people don't, you know, realize what you do and what you did. Um, but yeah, so it's great to be able to give back. And, you know, like Glenn said, we're 10 minutes away from each other. So for us to be that close and with Tyler growing up, like that was the son Glenn never had. And his daughters were, you know, he's got four girls and they're all like daughters that I never had. So it just, it works out really well. That's awesome. Four girls. 